You're listening to Irish Illustrated Insider. It is Thursday, August 22nd. I'm Tim Priester with Tim O'Malley from Irish Illustrated. John Bryce from Football Scoop is here. And so is Pete Sampson from The Athletic. We are now nine days away from Notre Dame taking on Texas A&M in College Station. We're going to talk a little bit, uh, a little bit about depth charts, a lot of uh, information that most of you know, but we'll get into some of the ones that are a little bit more hotly contested as we get down to the last uh, nine days before the opener. Quarterback uh, Tim O'Malley, I think we've known that. We knew that when he when it, we when we found out when we were in El Paso or shortly before that that he was yeah, going yeah. to be coming to Notre Dame. Riley Leonard, uh, and we're obviously we're going to talk a lot about Riley Leonard here in, in segment two with some questions. But uh, there was never any doubt. Steve Angeli put up a good fight. Played about as well as he possibly could in spot duty last year. And then again in the bowl game, there is very little you can do in spring practice, though, to to narrow the gap as long as, uh, you know, as long as the guy that you're bringing in is, um, is still in line to be the quarterback you thought he was when you recruited him. Yeah, I thought the news you put in Thursday Thoughts was relevant for the quarterback situation. C.J. Carr will be Connor Wegman this week or this coming week in practice. I assume when there's a more mobile quarterback, Kenny Minchie will be that quarterback. They can they can get some work in that way. Uh, of course, Gino Gadouli mentioned how he has to keep all four engaged. You just don't worry about that usually because you usually don't have four good quarterbacks. So to be blunt, once the season starts, one of them's not engaged. That's what happens. But I think it is a concern this time because, I mean, obviously, Steve Angeli is going to want to start somewhere. And he, number one place he wants to start is Notre Dame. Kenny Minchie's going to want to start somewhere. Number one is Notre Dame. And CJ Carr is right now all of our pick to start at Notre Dame. So you got to keep them all engaged. And that's really the that's where the quarterback depth chart works out for me. It's one, two, and then who gets to be the scout team guy? Yeah, pretty much. Well, guys, let's talk about running back. Uh John, you know, I I had, I was of the mindset that Jadarian Price would would end up being the starter going into that into the season. I don't really know why I felt that way because we've known that Dela McCullough is really, really high on Jeremiah Love. Obviously, it's a one-two punch. It's a it's a dynamic one-two punch, a mostly unproven one-two punch, and then you have the freshman behind them. Yeah, I just think that um, it's not a matter of, of Jadari and Price doing anything to lose it. I just think Jeremiah Love has really taken a giant step forward, and I think they're really encouraged with what he did over the summer, the very quality muscle mass that he added going from the guy who played the, the Sun Bowl at around 187 pounds to the now well documented up around 210 pounds, although he might have might have lost a couple of pounds over the course of the camp. But uh, it's just a matter of, of Jeremiah Love working to get it. Um, they're going to play both those guys a lot. But we when we visited with Jeremiah Love, I was struck by how candid he was in saying, I don't want to be the first or second down back. I want to be the every down back that does every single thing for this team. And he said, and when they let me, I'm going to try to return kicks and punts and run routes and do everything else. So I just think that it's um, it's a good problem to have because I think either player would start for a lot of programs. But Jeremiah Love, I think, is nudged ahead over the course of this camp. And Pete Sampson, we've seen – I mean, we, obviously, we got a really good look at Aeneas Williams in the spring, in the spring game, in the the Jersey scrimmage game. Uh, haven't seen, <laughs> we still haven't seen a whole lot of Keedron Young just because he was sidelined during the spring. And then there's Devin Ford. How, how do you, like, how do you think those three guys? What kind of role are they going to play for Notre Dame this year? I think they would be fortunate if one of them got to where Jabron Payne was last year. Um, I, cause I don't think there's going to be any more than that. I know, you know, Dylan has his jobs board for the position and likes to spread that around, but I just, you know, John mentioned it and we've all seen it from Jeremiah love. Like he's just, he's just better, um, than those other guys. And I think Jadarian is better than those other guys too. There's a big gap between one and two and the rest of the group. So, you know, if, if somebody carves out a short yardage role, I think we would look at Keaton Young and think he would be the guy based on how he's built, but we we wouldn't have thought Jabron Payne would have been the guy last year based on how he's built and he did a nice job of it. So maybe there's something there for somebody because um, they don't want to you know run love and price into the ground, but uh, I do think there's a pretty big gap between one and two and then three, four, five. You know, I did a study on this this past week for the last 15 years when you, how many backs can get carries. And it's interesting because if you go and, you got to remember Riley Leonard is going to get a lot of carries. So that takes away a lot of opportunity for Aeneas Williams, who I think will emerge as the third back for Kedron Young. Um, 
in those years, even when Notre Dame's super run heavy. I, 2017, you got to throw out because all they did was run in 2017, except against Georgia when they chose to pass, as Pete likes to point out, which was not the best plan. <laughs> but I I don't think you're going to get a Tyrese situation from a few years ago where Estime was 160 carries or, or Diggs was 160, Estime was 150, and Tyree was 100. I don't think that's coming. That only happened because Jack Cohn was the quarterback. It is going to be Riley Leonard is your third leading rusher. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and and we're going to talk more about, I mean, we have questions in the second segment about Riley Leonard and just how much he will run, uh, as, particularly in the Texas A&M game. Uh, but, Tim, I know you've been really high on Devin Ford, uh, you know, mainly his role as a, quote, special teams captain. Right. Do you see a role for him in the backfield at, uh, this season? You know, I would say if love, I don't think Price left off as a very good pass protecting running back last year. So he would have to have made strides to win the job over love. If they don't love Jeremiah, if they, if they don't want Jeremiah love in that role against A&M, that could be Ford because I take deal at his word when he said his coaching malpractice to put her, they, he, they love Aeneas Williams in that role, but can he, can he figure it out in front of 110 wild screaming fans on third and 13 at the six yard line where the, or, you know, that that's a tough situation for him. Maybe you trust Devin Ford there, but if Aeneas Williams is the best, they might end up trusting him. I mean, he was he was the best for a while. Jeremiah Love has to come out at some point. Third and 13 might be the time Jeremiah Love comes out of the game. It's 100 degrees. You know, he's he's not playing every snap. Yeah, I think that's a good point. That's a good good spot for Devin Ford. We saw we saw what he could do last year. I mean, they flat out just brought him in sometimes on third and long, knowing full well that yeah. he was going to hold up as a pass blocker. We've gone over and over and over and over the wide receiver's but we know the following six are front runners, and I'm going to do them in uh, numerical order. Order numerical is in the number they wear on their backs. Nice, Jaden Greathouse, Jaden Harrison, Bo, Bo Collins, Jordan Faison, Chris Mitchell, and of course Jaden Thomas. I don't, you know, I mean, I don't think that there's any real great mystery as to the order there. Um, they like Greathouse and Harrison in the slot. They like Collins and Thomas uh, at, at the big receiver, at the b- boundary receiver, and then you have uh, a combination of Mitchell and Faison uh, at the X, the field position. And, you know, every time we ask Mike Brown about it, he says it's difficult to play more than six. Now, he gave a, cav- a caveat last week when he said, you know, unless you have a specific play or package for a certain player. Micah Gilbert, I think, would fall into that category because we – we are aware of the fact that they like him in the red zone, whether they go to him in the red zone against Texas A&M. That's a little bit like throwing an ES Mil- uh, Williams in there to, to block on third and long, perhaps. But they've got a good group. There's still speculation out there among the national media about how good the group is. Tim, well, you, you listed them as when you broke it down to playoff level and I like, I love the wide receivers yeah. for this year. It, it, if you look, it, there's speculations natural. Cause if you look down, I think Pete brought this up before Jaden Harrison had how many catches at Marshall Jaden Greathouse comes back with 28 catches. Like Mitchell Evans is by far the most intriguing press. Bo Collins didn't even have a ton of catches. I suppose if you look at Chris Mitchell, you should understand from a national level, you brought that guy in, but I'll defer to JB here after this. I only have one thing to say. Jaden Harrison probably gets the sixth most snaps because he's behind Jaden Greathouse who will get the most and math has to work out. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm on record repeatedly as saying, I expect great house to probably lead the team overall in receptions. That doesn't necessarily mean I think he'll lead the team uh, in yards or anything like that. And then also I think Jaden Harrison is really poised to be a weapon for this Notre Dame team in special teams. I've heard that too consistently since his arrival and even more so over the course of this summer. And so I think those um, those are some ways that Jaden Harrison's going to get additional snaps and additional opportunities to impact the Notre Dame offense. Pete, is there somebody amongst this group that you like that maybe we don't talk about as much? I mean, I guess they're all kind of at the forefront, but yeah, uh, that's uh, this is like if you talk about a team for nine months, you talk about everybody. Um, yeah, like I, I just think it's it's probably underrated that Collins Mitchell and Harrison combined for 130 catches, 2,038 yards, and 13 touchdowns just last season. Um, so, like, the the level of proven commodities that Notre Dame got, I don't I don't think that you can overstate that. Um, I mean, Notre Dame hasn't had a 1,000-yard receiver since 2019. I sort of went through, and I believe 36 
power four programs have had one since then. Um, what I really want to see is contested catches. Mm-hmm. Chase Claypool led the team with 15 contested catches in 2019. Last year, Chris Tyree led the group with four. So that's like that. I want to see that part of the game come to life for the receiver group is can you go up and help your quarterback out in a way that they they just didn't last season? I I think that's a great point, Pete. And I think the guys and you guys chime in here at the forefront of contested catches this year would be Jaden Greathouse. I mean, you know, again, some of the bigger guys, Jaden Greathouse, uh, Jaden Thomas, and Bo Collins. I mean, the, those are the guys, yes. you know, yeah. those, those are the guys that give you a little bit of size. Uh, I, you know, I want to, I want to throw it now, you know, there are other guys, we don't know how much Michael Gilbert's going to play. We don't expect Cam Williams to play a whole lot. People have asked about him. He's just not, you know, I mean, they might view him a little bit differently if they didn't have the three grad transfers, but his game, he just needs to get stronger in his game. Like, I, I understand that some people are like, well, why isn't he further along? Part of it is the competition. Part of it is where he came from and his background, you know, compared to a Jaden Greathouse who uh, really came to Notre Dame with a great understanding of what it means to play wide receiver right. on a higher level. I, I've really been impressed with, again, from what little we've seen, we see some video from Notre Dame, but in person, Logan Saldate is a guy that that has worked at the the Z position. I think he has a bright future. It's just so darn crowded for a guy like that right now. KK Smith, where does where does he fit in? Uh, he's he was playing the X when we saw the other day with Mitchell and Faison. Faison can play the slot. Tim, that's another uh, when you do the math. Faison oh, may it pop is. into the the Z the Z position, the slot position, and the, the tight end plays the slot too. Really, he takes the position. Right, the exactly. So, it takes look, it, it's a great situation. I don't think that it's a, among the best wide receiving cores in the country, but it's pretty damn good. And it, for Notre Dame standards in the last couple of years, it's it's really, really good. And I think Riley Leonard has a whole lot to work with there. Now, just, it'll be... Just to, Tim, to put a bow on it, Pete inspired me to look very quickly. Uh, 12 contested catches for Chris Mitchell, Pete. So he will be the... Uh, he's another guy you could have. I was not... Now, yeah, he's played not... some better corners, but 12 contested catches is a downfield receiver is good. I, no, you know, I just said... I was going back over Mike Brown's quotes about Chris Mitchell and it was like, well, at, at F A I U, um, F-I-U. Yep. I was, I cannot keep those straight. Um, it was like, Hey, he just ran all these go routes and we're asking him to do more. I'm like, why don't you let's do the go routes? Like, <laughs> I mean, he was really good at those go routes. So I, it just struck me as like, let's not overthink this. Let's just, well, I don't do think what that Chris means- Mitchell does well and, and lean into that. I don't think that means they're going to eliminate the go routes. I hope not. Just trying to (laughs) make him uh, a more complete receiver. JB tight ends uh, with a healthy Mitchell Evans. This has got to be one of the most power packed tight end rooms in the country. Yeah, and just uh, real quickly wrapping up my my viewpoint on the wide receivers is we know Bo Collins, I think, won pretty much all the individual sports performance testing metrics at the end of July right before they started camp. So you have to feel like he's a guy that gives you a chance for some contested catches and can also get up for some 50-50 balls that we didn't see much out of uh, Sam Hartman willing to throw a year ago. And I also think that's an area where Chris Mitchell, not as strong as a great house or um, as Bo Collins, but he's also got some nice leaping ability. He also could be a factor. So that's just a couple of things that I'm looking for from those guys, not not per se against the Aggies, but over the course of the season that they need to be able to become a viable component of this Notre Dame offense for it to continue to evolve. At tight end, if Mitchell Evans is ready to go, if they get, I don't know, X number of snaps from him next week, but they're effective snaps coupled with Eli Raritan being fully healthy and just really one of the best athletes overall on the team. And and what we continue to hear about Cooper Flanagan, then yeah, if, if they, they've got those three, if they feel really good with those, if Mitchell trusts his knee and feels full tilt against Texas A&M, there's going to be very few tight end groups anywhere in the country uh, that would be on a level with Notre Dame's group. And so, JB, since you jump back to wide receivers, let me put a, a, a final or finer point on that. We expect Jaden Greathouse to start at the Z. We expect uh, Chris Mitchell at the X and Bo Collins at the W. Now, when we've been out there, we've generally seen Jaden Thomas, and Jaden Thomas certainly is going to mix in there freely. But I think when they start things out, when when they have their three wideouts on the field, those will be the three. Tim, uh, I wonder how 
I wonder how far along we're going to find out here real soon, but we're going to find out how far along Kevin Bauman is and just exactly what role he will play. Because I would imagine with a he healthy Kevin Bauman, uh, we see less of what we've seen of David Sherwood in yeah. recent years. Well, I think so because they mentioned Kevin Bauman and said he's already full go in our goal line packages. I assume that's inside the five because obviously inside the red zone, your goal line package probably involves a lot of Eli Raritan and Mitchell Evans. So mm -hmm. goal to go in that package could be some Kevin Bauman. Probably not much Mitchell Evans right now if you're trying to manage his snaps a little bit. Cooper Flanagan has the body for that. I hope they're not always in, in uh, heavy and in jumbo in short yardage situations. I love the modern idea of spreading it out more and letting Jeremiah Love and Riley Leonard be able to read it out against one athlete in space. But uh, I think that's Bauman's role. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't I, think they're going to be always in heavy. Um, again, as the offense has evolved over the course of camp, as we have all talked to people uh, that were at last weekend's scrimmage, the really decisive closing scrimmage of fall camp, preseason camp, whatever you want to call it. Um, Riley Leonard used his legs a lot. They're going to incorporate his legs a lot. I do think Ballman gives you uh, a guy that's really big, physical, healthy that packs some real power behind him to help on that left side of the offensive line to do a little bit more chipping where you feel it's going to be a bit more necessary than obviously you ever had to worry about in previous two, two and a half seasons with, with Joe Alt owning that position. But I do think that Riley Leonard, they're poised to let him open things up. I think the nature and the construct of the offensive line will force you to allow Riley Leonard to run some for you. Pete, how far along do you think Mitchell Evans is? I mean, what 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 are we going to see next Saturday from him? That actually is one of my biggest, like, you put the offensive line to the side, but that is really one of my bigger questions of opening weekend because I, I don't know. I have a hard time believing that he's going to be playing a ton on Saturday. Um, we'll see. It, it, it definitely could prove me wrong. Um, I just feel like every time we're out there, he's not doing stuff. Um, so we'll, but you know, he hasn't been running around with a brace, so we'll see. I just, uh, that, that is like really one of my bigger questions for, for a &M. Oh, The offensive line, uh, obviously we know 60% of it. We know for, they might have know. a new starter, Tim, they might have a new starter on the offensive line. I heard, I read this. So there's a, is that right? Yep. They could. Is that the first you've heard of that? It is. I've been. I caught up on my. I was going over some papers at my breakfast table, and I caught up. Uh, on okay. It. Well, Emil Wagner at, at right tackle, and Billy Strouth at right guard, and Ashton Craig at center. That's a pretty good group, and I said it on Monday, and and I will stand by it until I see otherwise. I think Emil Wagner will be ready for this opportunity. It's a tough one against A and M. Depends upon what kind of matchup matchups he gets, and Nick Scorton obviously is the. Challenging one, but uh, in in uh, in some intel f that that I've gathered here recently, it's still the same two at at left tackle, left guard, and in the starting lineup, uh, Anthony Knapp and Sam Pendleton. Have you heard? Uh, heard anything different? Uh, have you heard anything different, JB? No, I've not. I've not heard anything different, and that includes um, even up to lunchtime today. I haven't, I haven't heard anything differently. So, yeah. um, again, uh, those are the guys that got the the work in that magnitude scrimmage last Saturday. That, that scrimmage that had a lot uh, to determine the direction of the two weeks of game prep. prep steered for Texas A&M, and, and what I will continue to emphasize is the single biggest game thus far of Marcus Freeman's coaching career. It's that big. So um, we heard that last week. They they used some tight ends to help those guys on the left side, especially at the left tackle, do some chipping. We'll continue to see more of that. But I haven't heard anything other than um, Knapp and Pendleton now for about the last 14 days. You know, everybody, everybody talks about you know, pass protection, and I understand that's huge. You got to keep Riley Leonard clean. You're concerned about a true freshman at left tackle, but you know these guys got to run block too. I, I you know, it, it's all moot if if you can't run the ball either. So, I mean, yes, because they're not going to do great in third and thirteen. Actually, yeah, that pass pro is real hard. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really I, hard know, down. Very few teams do when you're consistently put in that situation, but. These two young guys are going to have to get some push up front, and it's one of the more stout defensive lines in the country, with the with the Shamars uh, uh, running around out there on uh, one on the interior, one now on the edge. Um, yeah, I mean you got you've got and and frankly, I mean what were what 
what was the turning point in making this decision? Maybe it's that. Although Rocco Spindler is a physical guy and, and uh, certainly Pat Coogan with a, as a 13-game starter last year, I thought was pretty stout at times. How do you guys feel about this? 60 snaps, Sam Pendleton can start the whole game. You want more than 60 snaps. You want 85 snaps. You want 81 snaps. Do you have to use Pat Coogan as well if you have 81 snaps in College Station in the heat with I mean, Sam I, Pendleton's first yeah, game? Yeah, I think you'd feel pretty good about putting Coogan in there. He, right. he, you don't, you don't be... sub out your left tackle, obviously, the situation. Yeah, but... yeah. So, uh, yeah, but as it, as it stands right now, we've talked a lot about whether Pat Coogan – that being the safer choice, Pete Sampson, that was something you and I were kind of in agreement with on Monday yeah. that that's a that's a safer choice, but it doesn't look like they're going to go in that direction. Yeah, it's uh, I mean, they have rotated offensive linemen in games before. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think that's a great idea. Louisville um, was one of those games, so that was not as cool as usual. But that yeah, was... I don't. Um, this is yeah, this is this is the biggest hang up for me next weekend is just I don't. I don't know if they're going to be able to block Texas A&M. Um, those guys could be good down the road, but A&M will be the worst they ever play because it's the first time they'll ever play together and in that environment against that defensive line. So that's it's going to be tough. It's going and to be I, really, really tough. I don't agree with the sentiment. I've seen this attitude out there. Well, if you can't beat Texas A&M in the first game and they're probably like middle of the pack of the – the SEC, how are you going to beat these? Well, teams evolve. I mean, we see it every year. Teams evolve. So, and I, you know, I, I stand by the thought that Nordin could lose this game and still be a very good to great team. Now I hesitate to say great because of the condition of the offensive line, but with the rest of the team, and I, and I realize that that supersedes a lot of the, a lot of the strengths of the rest of the team, but I don't believe that if you, if you fail against Texas A&M, that you're, that, that means you're going to lose three games this year. I don't football sometimes works that way, but I don't think it works that way with this team because I been saying it since January. I thought this was a top five to seven team and that it's loaded. I've used those phrases over and over again. And I, and I, and I still think that that's, I think that's true. Moving on to the defensive line. I don't think there are any surprises there. RJ open. We have a question about him in second segment. Right. He'll, he'll be in the starting lineup. Uh, we know the tackles, uh, Cross and Mills, of course, Captain Mills. And then on the right side, uh, uh, Jordan Botello, of course. But we're going to see a bunch of other guys coming in. This is where you rotate. <laughs> Pete Sam's on the line. <laughs> I think, and I think it's a great idea. You think yeah, it's a without really good hesitation, idea. <laughs> without hesitation, too. Yes, there'll be plenty. I, although it might be a little less than you would have in the next coming. If, if you were playing Northern Illinois in 90 degrees, you'd rotate a lot more than any of them, just out of. Second, you got to rotate in the first half so you can have a second half where Howard Cross and Riley Mills are going the whole time. Yeah, it's just it's amazing to me when you look back at last year's offensive line or I'm sorry, defensive line. The guy with the fifth most snaps was Nana Asafa Mensa. If he was still on the roster, where would he fit? Uh, he would be a third teamer. Yeah, yeah. So if you want and, and that, like and, how, and, how much that position group has improved, there you go. Yeah, and that's largely the how, why the decision was made by... So they told him to leave. By, yeah, <laughs> yeah. By, by Notre Dame. And, <laughs> and that was, you know, Safa Mensa wanted to come back. I mean, he was tearful when he when he talked about it, but uh, he would have been third team and, and uh, you know, that, that wouldn't have been fair to him. So uh, clearly J- Josh Burnham's going to see playing time. Uh, you know, Bumkur Traore is probably the guy. I mean, that's that's pass rush. So we know he's going to get reps, uh, certainly in in passing situations. And then you know, and then of course, uh, we're not gonna we're probably not gonna see Logan Thomas this year, but they like him a lot. Uh, you know, the guy that's really on the bubble is uh, Junior Tui Alamaka, uh, because he is now third team at the Viper position. Um, so, and Bryce plenty, Young, plenty you of know, special Bryce, teams for Tui Halamaka. Yeah, know. right. Right. And Bryce Young is, is, is certainly the wild card there. Uh, when they use them, how much they use them, they're pretty, they have a pretty good one, two punch at the strong side end, uh, with, with, uh, with, with Oban and Burnham. So how many snaps you get for Bryce Young in this first game, uh, we're going to see. And, and, you know, Al Washington talked about using 11 or 12. You're going to see predominantly eight guys in this game on the defensive line playing. And um, 
you know, to your point about Junior Tui Alamaka and, and Young and Bryce Young and Logan Thomas, I just think Notre Dame, again, uh, under Marcus Freeman and company, have raised the athleticism so much that those guys um, can give you really quality reps on special teams so that you aren't using – as many of your defensive starters on those coverage units. And I think that's significant over the course of the season. I think that's particularly significant in a game that um, is going to be as hot and humid and muggy as it is going to be next Saturday in College Station. And now we have the the 10-day forecast is out. It's uh, going, going to be creeping up near 100 degrees there. It's been 100 degrees in Central Texas every day this week. So the more guys you have, like that, where Notre Dame has elevated its floor so much, I think it pe- starts paying dividends from the very first game. Is that a dry heat? Is that a dry heat, guys? Is it not going to feel hot? No, at all? I don't know. I don't think that that's it going is to not be a dry heat. Yeah. No, Trust not me. at all. Pete, how much is how much you think they're going to miss Gabe Rubio in a game like this? I think a lot, especially with Cross. Like, even if his hamstring is good to go, you know, he's missed quite a bit of conditioning, and we're talking about just what a blast furnace it's going to be down there so yeah I, I think Gabe Rubio would have been a huge addition um to have him healthy uh can they get through Saturday for sure uh but I I think that that would have that would have made this I mean this defense is like at full strength almost a perfect defense like they do they there is not a weak point anywhere and like we've replaced Oh, they don't have a fourth corner to like, well, their second team defensive tackle is maybe not as good as it could be. But it's um, if you had Rubio, it would almost be a perfect defense. And I would say that Notre Dame could probably get out of Texas A&M scoring 14 points and winning. And, you know, I mean, look, there's a lot of confidence in Jason Onye and Donovan Heinish, too. Now, who would have been the odd man out or would have been taking the third the third team reps had Rubio not been injured? Um, probably Heinish. Uh, you know, I guess it depends upon who needed a backup, but this is a good group. Sean Sevillano's day will come. It's not at Texas A&M, but we like what we saw him preseason. Same with Armel Mookum. Devin Houston's day comes even later than those two guys probably, uh, but they've got something building there. The linebackers, we know the five. Um, you know, Kaiser, we know is starting. I presume uh, Snead is, and then you're going to get a healthy dose of of, uh, D- of Drake Bowen, Kingston, Viliamuasa, and Jay Nosberry. There's a question in the second segment that uh, this is going to be my answer because as talented as this group is, there's no doubt about that. Jack Kaiser's the only one that's really played. Yeah, and I'll, like, if I had to bet, I think Kaiser will start at the will, and then it will be Bowen at the mic. Right. Yeah. I would I agree. Think, I don't yeah. think Snead will start unless it's at Rover in place of Jordan Clark. And they'll both uh, I mean, yeah. Jordan Clark's gonna play a lot. Um unless they just are running the ball at Notre Dame. If Howard Cross isn't 100 percent and Gabriel Rubio's not in there and you need to play a rover, then you can't play Jordan Clark as much. But that wouldn't be great for Notre Dame. They're a nickel defense. We tried to ask Max Bulla about that at linebacker. He goes, Yep, we play nickel. <laughs> he was just being as honest as he could be. It's that's the way you have to play nowadays. And Notre Dame will face a lot of nickel too. So it'll be intriguing to see end of September how the linebackers shake out. Uh, more so for me than Texas A and M. I, I could almost predict how they'll shake out at A and M. And end of September will be an interesting for around the Kaiser and his quartet. JB, let's jump ahead to the corners and because. We heard in the, the the scrimmage to wrap up camp that Benjamin Morrison and Christian Gray were nothing short of outstanding, um, and that's what we expect. Now, how much how much physical work did Morrison get Saturday? That's what I would be curious to know. Yeah, again, I don't think uh, I think they've been very cognizant about taking guys to the ground. We've heard that over the the limited exposure that we have on camp. They've tackled, they've wrapped up, but they've tried to keep guys upright. Um, Benjamin Morris has increased his his physical load, but he's still been very restrained in that regard. Um, he's but he's worked on press drills. We've seen that he's worked on press and trail drills. Um, he's been active in punt punt block simulation drills. Um, and again, Christian Gray has just had one of those camps that we just keep hearing about. I would say Christian Gray, from the people I've talked to, has had the type of camp on the defensive side of the ball that Jeremiah Love has had on the offensive side of the ball. I think that's the best way to put it. When you go beyond that, when you t- talk about who's maybe that that person beyond those guys that's had a really 
uh, incredible camp. It's Leonard Moore. They feel like he's the next to be truly elite. That was before uh, Pete Sampson started pulling all those hyperbolic statements out of Benjamin Morrison <laughs> a week ago. So um, that guy, they feel like is going to be really, really, really good. They feel like they've got multiple NFL cornerbacks, not just defensive backs. They feel like they've got multiple NFL cornerbacks in their program right now. I was going to turn to Sampson to talk about the number four cornerback because that's his favorite topic. But seriously, Pete, Jaden Mickey, First guy off the bench, no, undoubtedly. Leonard Moore, the true freshman. How much can they play those guys when you have two standouts like you do in the starting lineup? Well, it's, I mean, you think back to when they went to Ohio State, they played Mickey and Morrison right away. So neither of them were starters, but they played a lot. So, yeah, it, I think you can play them if they're good enough. I just – I think Gray and Morrison are so good that, like, yeah. I wouldn't mess around with that if I didn't have to. And – you know, we've met, we've heard about Jordan Clark, Rod Hurd, maybe Mickey helps you in the nickel there. You know, is it, is it, do they try to go that route? I'm not really sure, but um, yeah, the, the secondary was interesting. Cause like in the summer and the spring, what I had heard is like the staff was concerned that they weren't deep enough. Um, you know, that it went yeah. more beyond like, we don't have a fourth corner. It's just yeah. like, we don't have enough guys. Uh, and I think they go into the season. I don't think a position had a better camp than the secondary did. I would just follow up briefly on that. That's a great point, Pete, because I think we all know as they exited spring, they felt they probably needed to wait into the portal and see if they could get one more player to help the secondary. And then as summer unfolded, um, they started feeling better about those guys. And then with the camp that they had with, with Leonard Moore, they feel really good about where they are. And, and probably hindsight um, always being the friend, they feel good that they didn't take somebody out of the yep. portal. I'm going to pick up the pace here a little bit to finish up segment one at safety. Of course, we know Xavier Watts is in the starting lineup, and we'll see if it's a Don Shuler or Rod Hurd. I think they both play opposite uh, Watts, but, well, I'm not sure that they're exactly at the same position, but it's going to be very interesting to see just how good Rod Hurd is in the lineup for Notre Dame. We know he was very good at Northwestern, and a Don Shuler is one of those fast risers. Uh, Luke Telich will likely get some playing time as well. And then jumping over to the, the kicker and punter, James Rendell, really looking forward to see what those, those, those diagonal side spirals look like when, mm -hmm. when Texas A&M is trying to field them. I heard something about Mitch Jeter. I think they're a little bit concerned about operation time. You know, how quickly he gets to the ball after the ball is snapped and, you know, I've got to say, I mean, we saw him be, he was inconsistent in the spring. And at our last practice, I saw him miss back-to-back 40-some -back yarders. So I don't know if there's concern there. His track record is outstanding. Uh, but but I think they're looking at speeding up his process a little bit because I think when they put a, a stopwatch on it, I think when Marty Biaggi puts a stopwatch on it, it might not be quite as rapid as as they would like. Have you guys heard anything about that? Uh, I haven't heard operation time, but I would just say, I think it would be fair to say that if you took the, all the viewings of Mitch Jeter, he does not look like a guy who's only missed two field goals. I would agree with that. And then on Rendell, I think TNO, TO and I hit on this the other day in our session about the over under of muff punts. And I think TO might've said it at like four and four and a half. Uh, when you talk to people inside the program, I think they expect, that over to hit. I think they would set the over even higher. We'll see if that becomes the reality. But some uh, some stuff I've heard as the week has gone on is that they really believe people are going to have a difficult time catching Jame Rendell's offerings. And in talking to you know the the top two punt returners, phase on a great house, they both said that it's quite tricky handling it, and they're going to be interested to see what what opposing punt returners do with James James Rendell's punts. We're going to be back segment two, burning up the boards. If you're coming to a game this season, you have to check out Game Day Your Way, Notre Dame's tailgate service provider. Game Day offers everything you need, including tailgate gear, catering, and even beverage delivery right to your spot. And their Irish Express transportation from Chicago allows you to tailgate while you travel to their all-inclusive party zone in South Bend. Let Game Day deal with all the hassle so you can focus on the fun. For tailgates, tickets, transportation, and more, visit gamedayyourway.com. Welcome back to segment two, burning up the boards. Our first question is actually a combo. The first is Z Thundy one. You're the offensive coordinator against Texas A&M. That would be Mike Denbrock in reality. What's the strategy to make Leonard successful and not Jay to one wonders. 
What things can Indy do schematically to slow down AM's pressure, considering they will have the most inexperienced offensive line in recent and old memory? I like the wording of that one. I, you know, I, I went back and looked at what I wrote about Riley Leonard in a preview last year, and I clearly said he would he would carry the football dub, double digit times. Now I know there were sacks involved, but he had 18 rushes uh, against Notre Dame, and I, the RPO game is going to be hugely significant in Mike Denbrock's game plan against Texas A&M and uh, fighting Irish lover seven had a question about Jaden Harrison. Hadn't heard much about him. I think you're going to hear uh, your, his name will be called, I think at Texas A&M because I, you know, what are the things you can do to loosen things up against that defense, the front, I think jet sweeps, you know, force that defensive line to play laterally. And then I'm really interested to see what kind of screen game, uh, you know, those kind of things that Mike Denbrock incorporates, because again, that's a Jared, uh, Jaden Harrison type type thing. And then obviously throwing the ball to Jeremiah Love. So, you know, I think there are quite a few things that they can do to, to try to loosen things up. But at, at the top of my list is Riley Leonard running RPO read option stuff, uh, hopefully making, you know, really sound decisions. That's what really makes it effective. I mean, it, it doesn't matter how many, times he keeps it if he makes strong decisions on handing it off but uh, I'm confident that he he makes good decisions and that's Sam Hartman never tried to make good decisions in in uh, the read option game yeah I think it's it's Riley Leonard's legs it's what Notre Dame can do misdirectionally particularly in the screen games whether that's a backside screen or just a well-developed screen uh, we know that they believe in the athleticism of this offensive line that should be something that's an asset in the screen game, especially if they're having a hard time slowing down a and and then I think the tight ends over the middle can be uh, very much a huge key for Notre Dame. Love a good tunnel screen um, and if last weekend scrimmage video that Notre Dame put out was any indication there was clearly an empty set where Jeremiah Love was split out in the slot and it was a designed run for Riley Leonard like you can't get any more simple than that um, but that could be a real weapon to help out the offensive line too. Tim you said 18 carries for Riley Leonard against Notre Dame last year mm -hmm. and sacks count you know that if he would have had 17 carries against Notre Dame instead of 18 he wouldn't be on Notre Dame anymore. <laughs> yes. Yeah I know I do know that yeah you know uh Tunnel screens, you know, maybe a KK Smith, somebody like that, if you're going to dig into the bag of tricks. But, I, but I think, yeah, go ahead, Tim. I think I'm digging into the Jaden Harrison bag of tricks that you mentioned. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just going to go. Harrison, yeah, like Jaden Harrison you can, are you can my tunnel screen guys. Tunnel screens, guys on, both for, screens yes. on both sides. Tunnel screens on both sides if you wanted to. <laughs> Pete, just throw deep to Mitchell just and go tunnel nuts. screens everywhere, right? There's... <laughs> it'll be, it'll, will be really interesting from game one to start tracking how Mike Den, how the, the various ways that Mike Denbrock uses Jeremiah Love, because I think it's going to be mo a multitude of ways. Question from Irish John M. Haven't heard much about R.J. Oban. Is he still uh, in line to be the starting strong side defensive end, or has Burnham jumped him? I'm a little surprised that the question is having not heard much, considering um, we wrote about R.J. Oban very specifically in a practice report last week, and I made a point to note either on a, a video analysis or a podcast recently that he was so good that uh, Washington basically stopped a drill and said, yes, that's exactly how it's done. That's what we want every time. You go through the guy, not to the guy. So R.J. Oban's going to start. I think he's had a very nice camp. I think that um, I believe we all four would agree that he physically looks changed and better than he did when he got here in the spring. Burnham had a really good camp, too. That's the good news of the question. They yeah, do have two guys over there. That, right. that, you don't Pete have said, to worry about who starts. It, it, yeah, we don't know if either one will be JJB from last year. JB, and I talked about that on Irish Illustrated Spotlight, but I do think Joshua Burnham will be better than what Pete pointed out, Nano Osafa Mensa. I think he'll have more impactful snaps than Osafa Mensa did as the backup. I mean, Javante John-Baptiste was outstanding last year for Notre Dame. I think Priester and I ranked him four and five at the end of the year, all players on the team. But I don't think Oban gets there, but it's also because... As Pete said, they almost have a perfect defense when they're healthy. So it's hard to be the fourth or fifth best player on this team. You don't you don't remove RJ Oban from the starting lineup. The veteran Nate the, the veteran nature that he brings to this defense and to that position, having lost JJB, is uh is is immense. And then of course you have the you know, you have the Bryce Young factor. I'm sure they want to get him in there. 
you know, as much as they want to get uh, Bubakar Traore in there as well. Well, plus RJ Oban knows Mike Elko's defense and, and knows some of their tendencies when it's third down and certain situational football elements. So that's another valuable component, more so week one um, than it, than maybe against just some random opponent. But yeah, I think um, we've done a bad job if we haven't said enough about RJ Oban because yeah. I think he's had a nice camp. I think you've said the most about him. I, I have not. And so that's why I included the question. Looking to upgrade your wardrobe, founded by Notre Dame alum Gao Wang, you've seen ESQ's custom clothing on the player walk and all of your favorite players and coaches. With over a decade of making the best bespoke clothing available, ESQ will help you look and feel your best. From a perfect fitting suit or sport coat, shirt or bomber jacket, or that perfect tuxedo for wedding season, check out esqclothing.com and book an appointment to upgrade your wardrobe today. Mention Irish Illustrated and get 10% off your entire purchase. That's esqclothing.com. Next question is from IR15HZIG, who will be that? from the program if he's going to keep that up. Tough road environment, Nick Skirton, and the difficulty of offensive tackle position notwithstanding, what percent chance do you give Anthony Knapp to be just good? Very quickly. And that's actually a really good point because that's what they need from Anthony Knapp is he doesn't have to remind you of Joel. Yeah. Pete Sampson? Uh, 18.7%. <laughs> that was lower than I thought you might go, but. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't know to put a percentage on it. I just think um, this coaching staff very, very obviously believes in Knapp. Um, he's got to be functional in 12 days, nine days, whatever it is, college station, nine days, he's got to be very functional for Notre Dame. And then he's going to be better the very next week for Notre Dame against Northern Illinois. And he should be better the very next week against mm -hmm. Purdue and so on and so forth. But um, they obviously have a lot of belief in him. They like the physical talent there. Um, and it's just catching him up to speed as quickly as possible. I think the first step is just be adequate before you can just be good. Right. Functional. Though, yeah, yeah, exactly, JB. And I, you know, one of the things I like, tried to watch him that when I was going through those two practices where I wanted to really just study the offensive line. But one of the things I love about Nap is and and you know, you you look this is one of the first things you look for in an offensive lineman, a guy that just stays under control and doesn't lunge. There's a tendency that, oh, I want to be aggressive, and then you lunge into blocks and you end up whiffing. I think he stayed composed, at least on the practice field when we've seen him. Uh, if, uh, you know, again, hold up in the run game. It's really important, um, you know, that him and Pendleton, if it is indeed Pendleton and not Coogan, or if it is Coogan, th that side of the line has to be able to, um, you know, put some things together to run the football. But I, I don't think there's any doubt that Notre Dame's going to be favoring, you know, center, right guard, right tackle in this game. Um, you, know, you have to mix it up. You can't just focus on that uh, the whole time. But I don't know what percentage I'd put on it, Pete, 18.7. I'm not sure. I think I would probably put a little greater percentage on that because I think that he's pretty fundamentally sound for a freshman, but not a whole lot greater than that because he's going against he's going against the stud in, in Nick Skirton. I'm at like 95% uh, that he'll be better than Baker would have been. So that's what really well, see yes. that, that that's exactly. Yeah. I, yes. I, I told, yes. Yes. I agree with that. And that's why when Joe Rudolph said, you know, we're, we're confident. And I, I think those were just words and, and I, I wasn't confident when he was saying it. It was a, pro oh, yeah. well, I mean, here we go. Let's, we'll never know. I don't think we have to see what Anthony Knapp can do. It's not going to be as Pete said, it won't be his greatest day, but it's the best they have. And that's the way to go with it. Obviously. Birdman NDO6, much of the talk amongst both media and fans during camp has focused on the offensive line as a potential weakness for Notre Dame. What is the biggest potential weakness for Notre Dame that no one is talking about? John. Do you think Pete Sampson has talked about this? So, but I'll let you guys all go before me. You know, I think there's enough to be a little bit concerned about Mitch Jeter. Um, you brought in a guy that was one of the most accurate kickers in the history of college football. Um, expecting him to to be that same person for you, if not even better, into a super senior year. Um, he was a little inconsistent in the spring. He's been a little inconsistent in camp. They're still super confident in him. They still call him Money Mitch. Um, but I just think if if there's one area we're not talking about enough, and it could 
that's a very visible one that you could see cost a game. So for It'll me, it's, bad. I'm not saying I'm predicting that. I'm saying that's an, an eventuality that could happen out there. It would be bad for his confidence if they start calling like missing Mitch though. So I think they have to keep calling <laughs> money Mitch until that first kick. Cause he I'm just I, like, if Mitch Jeter hits his first 42 yarder at Texas A&M, I'm simplifying things again, but it's taking off. He's a kicker that's missed twice in his life. Let's not, right. you know, if he, if he hits his first one and under high pressure, you have he's, more faith. He's going to hit his made him one, in right? Kyle field. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he, he has been there. That's right. He has P P we, you and I tag team the interview with him that day and, I came away very impressed with them that, Oh yeah. You know, the confidence that, that kickers have to have, they, they, they talk the talk. They have to, they have to think that way. Uh, and I am still comp. Yeah. I mean, he's done it in the past, but we saw a bunch of misses in the spring and, and, um, some, and some in the, the, the last practice that, that I saw. So, um, yeah, you know, concerned about that. But mine, and I alluded to this in segment one, mine is the young linebackers. And, you know, not that they aren't going to be good players, not that they aren't already good players, but all it takes is one false step at the wrong time when Texas a and throws something at you up front that you weren't expecting. And that happens all the time in these kind of matchups. So, you know, Kaiser, it's great to have Kaiser there. I, Sneed should be a more disciplined better football player, but when I think about, you know, Bowen, KVA and, KVA and Osbury playing, it just takes one slight hesitation move in the wrong way when you misread something up front to spring somebody. And it's usually the kind of mistake that, you know, the the sports writer and the, the fan doesn't necessarily know that he made the mistake on that play, but that's a little concerning. We know they're going to be good, but how soon before they're really, really good? Uh, O'Malley, what was my great answer for this that I don't remember having? No, you're on the linebackers. If you were yes. Texas A&M, you would. Yeah, be... and it's I would include Snead in the young linebackers. Yeah. That's yeah. that. Yeah. That's the guy that I could see just getting too because hyped over, up. Yeah, he's too old. He's overly and aggressive. Gets turned around and something gets turned. And it's like, look, I mean, there. This happens to old linebackers too. One of the biggest plays that we probably don't spend enough time on from Ohio State was. A, a bad run fit by an old linebacker um, that it happens to old linebackers too. But I, right, right. if I was going to attack Notre Dame's defense, I would, if they're, if they ever got to a set where it was Snead and Bowen or Snead and KVA, or there was some combination of younger linebackers out there, I, I, that would be something that I would try to hit horizontally and, and try to cross them. Up. And that's what, that's what opposing offensive coordinators look for. Who's the guy that we can game you know, we can play a game that throws that, that makes yep. him commit to that because we want to go this way instead. I, I I can see that happening, but again, it's a great, it's going to be a really, really good room. Uh, it should be a really, really good room by mid season moving on. Then they also look for Dante Vaughn on the field in playoff games. Coordinators is always the rough Yes. One. Dante Vaughn's in, Dante Vaughn's <laughs> in. We have a question from, uh, from Penn and Paul, L. Golden had something ready for Ohio State and USC last year. Fair to say he'll have something ready for Texas A&M. How do you view the matchup of L. Golden versus Colin Klein? I wrote about this a little bit in, in uh, today's Thursday Thoughts. I mean, I L. Golden in his third year with this veteran defense, he he has the advantage on paper. Colin Klein can go ahead. And Colin Klein can have a great day and beat Notre Dame and L. Golden, but he's gonna have he's the one that has to show it. Al Golden has had – you could have hit the ground running with this in April if you were Al Golden and played the game. I mean, they're they're better off now. It would not surprise me if Al Golden ate Colin Klein's lunch. I think I was sitting here after I noticed this question, after TP sent the rundown and, and trying to think about it. What defensive coordinator in college football would you take right now over Al Golden? Is there – like, I don't, I don't know that there's – even much conversation you could talk about maybe Jim Knowles at Ohio state um, because especially what yep. he was able to do for so many years at Oak state with lesser. Also count. in his third year, JB, good point. Correct. Also in his third year. Yes. That's, that's right. Um, but I just think we heard Marcus Freeman sort of unsolicited gush about how much he loves this coaching staff. And I think uh, a hell of a large part of that is because of the, the assets that they feel that they have 
uh, at the pinnacle positions on the offensive and defensive side of the ball. But um, Al Golden turned down a couple of um, entreaties over the last coaching carousel because he remained committed to Notre Dame and got that new deal, as we long ago reported at Notre Dame. I think he's elite. Um, I think that um, Al Golden has probably shut down more veteran offensive coordinators than Colin Klein before, and certainly uh, more veteran offensive coordinators that don't have uh, similar offensive line questions to what Texas A&M and Notre Dame share. I think Al Golden is ultra aggressive against Texas A&M, against that offensive line, uh, which still has a lot to prove. You have a lot of faith in your lockdown corners. So, you know, I mean, you don't have a problem putting your corners in one-on-one situations. I think Al Golden is going to be ultra aggressive um, uh, against that line and, and, uh, and against Connor Wigman who, what's the deal with, have you guys heard about him and his weight gain and how uh, he, the Jeff Tarpley from Gigum Aggie, one of the things he, he wrote about okay, right. Connor that, Wegman was he's put on weight. I just thought he was stronger at first, but now that I started seeing now, there's some weight gain involved. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> and I've, and I, I heard from others regarding that and it, like it made me think of Deshaun Kaiser <laughs> oh, coming back after his first I, I'm really interested to see what what he looks like. I mean, he's listed at six three two. He was listed at six three two twenty last year. I, I don't I don't know how much he's gained. Look, he's mobile. He's not Riley Leonard by any means, but he's capable of escape. He's, he's good at escaping. Uh, they 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 keep their metrics for escapability by uh, P, PFF, and uh, he has good numbers just like Riley Leonard does. But um, Ultra aggressive L Golden versus Colin Klein. I may stop short of saying uh eating Colin Klein's lunch, but I hear what you're saying, Pete Sampson. I think it could it could so, definitely go in that direction. I had to do a big picture story at the athletic on Notre Dame next week, and you know, you call other coaches to do the coaching anonymous thing. So I talked to a power five assistant who faced Notre Dame last year, and he said, like, one of the things about Golden that is so the biggest pain in the ass is they put so much on tape. You have to prepare for everything. And then I'll come up with something that he's never shown before. Um, and it just forces you to adjust so quickly and adapt so quickly to what your thought the game plan was going to be. You see drop eight against USC. You see a very basic vanilla defense against Ohio state. And like on top of that, whatever they do, they do it extremely well. Like they don't, they don't give you anything cheap. So that. Man, I just I have a hard time seeing AM having a whole lot of success against Notre Dame because I, I just think Al Golden is so far ahead of where Colin Klein is right now um, as a coordinator in terms of developing his side of the ball. Well, now I did I liked when when we thought that Colin Klein was going to be the offensive coordinator of Notre Dame. I liked his film. I liked his um uh diversity in his in the in what he did offensively. He took I mean, if you look at what the way Kansas State's offensive numbers improved uh, in in year one and then year two, especially in year two, you know, last year Kansas State was number two in the country in in red zone touchdown percentage offensively. So he's good, yeah. But, but he's going against Al Golden, and that's a different animal. We have a question from uh, Tim, Co- one one real thing, sure. real fast, Tim. I want everybody to remember that at the end of the two 2000- thousand. 22 season, Marcus Freeman's first. There were at least five people in the industry that said Al Golden should be replaced because he doesn't recruit well enough. That was a thing. It happened. It was the dumbest thing that has been said about Notre Dame football in several years. Go ahead. Well, you know, it's funny you bring that up because I've been, I've had a long career doing this and I can remember, um, you know, do you you take, do you take the coach? This was way back when, when recruiting, I mean, it's so emphasized now, um, but it was like, do you take the, when, when you hire a coach, is it more his ability to coach football or his recruiting ability? Lou Holtz, I, like, I, like, sp- I think he spat on the ground when he, when he was asked that question because he absolutely believed in the guy that could coach it, coach the players up the best. It's a little bit different now. Recruiting is is so cutthroat and so it's a 13 month, 13 month a year job now. Uh, but you know, I, I still believe that at the end of the day, first and foremost, it has to be how well you coach up the players question from coach Aguilar, what offensive position coach current or previous staffs 
I, I did actually, I didn't read that second part. So I'm going to keep it to one offensive position coach currently has similar juice to Max Bulla as it pertains to enjoying their interviews with the media. Oh, Dela McCullough. <clears throat> it's Dela McCullough. Dela McCullough is an elite interview. Um, lock the house. I Just love that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, th I think I think I think Dela McCullough probably records it and listens to it back. Well, if he's in, interested in improving, he does. It's all about reps. Right. So, um, I love the Dela McCullough interviews. Um, I haven't written it yet. I've been written other places. I'll have it on Football Scoop in the coming weeks. Um, him talking about locking the house. He always has uh, something um, that he does very well to resonate with his teams. But Dylan McCullough is like, and, and Max Bella are like Mike Gundy yesterday on Pat McAfee's show when Gundy's kids told him, hey, don't screw this up, Dad. We really like Pat McAfee. And he said, guys, I'm not going to screw it up. I'm a great interview because I don't do coach speak. And he proceeded to not do coach speak. So um, I love that a lot. I, I like the guys who enjoy uh, being in front of us. And there are some guys that don't necessarily enjoy it, but they still are really quality interviews yes. because they're yep. so uh, they're so thought provoking and they're so intelligent in the football world. Um, but yeah, Max Bulla and Diva McCullough are two of the best interviews going anywhere. Tim, would you would agree with McCullough and what, what, oh, yeah. what, but what if, previous think, coach? What Rod, previous... He was, he's on the news today. Chuck Martin was the greatest. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I used to think that, the funniest line was, it's like, we're at recess and they have the first 85 picks. That's my favorite Chuck Martin line. It's absolutely fantastic when they came to play Notre Dame. But the thing about Alabama stealing his kicker and tripling down on it is wonderful. It's just fantastic. Chuck Martin's awesome. I love listening to Chuck Martin. You can you transcribe him. I'll listen to him. Ooh, transcribing's tough. We've said that before. That is a full day's work transcribing. Can you imagine? Oh man, no. <laughs> I, I I mean it's well known at least uh, by Irish Illustrated that the thing that I dislike the most about the job is transcribing. Uh, Chuck Martin would be the the absolute worst. All right, we're going to wrap up with a question from Caden MC, and it is this: Considering the matchups and personnel, which quarterback would you rather have on your side in the matchup with Texas A and M? It's a no brainer. It's it's Riley Leonard. Um, Riley Leonard has improved his passing, uh, both accuracy and velo. He was already nice in those categories to begin with. He's a very natural leader. Um, I've heard it enough, again, unprompted over the course of the his, the months since his arrival to believe there's authenticity there, which is not always the case when you hear about quarterback leadership. Um, and then he's got uh, very good wheels and very good athleticism. So when a guy's challenging – Bo Collins and sports performance testing um, that tells you the belief he has in his skills and the belief he has in his ability to compete. I mean, we've got two really good defensive lines and two really bad offensive lines. So would you rather have the mobile quarterback or the stationary quarterback? Right. I'm not here for your simplification. Dude. I, know, I, I, I was going to say, this is a, this <laughs> is a great question. If, right, if this is a great question, if Riley Leonard is not allowed to leave the pocket, then, then you're in trouble if you're. Yeah. Well, we in the last podcast we talked a lot about Connor Wigman because we were asked a question about Connor Wigman, yes, and so we were asked about Riley Leonard during that question. No, me. we weren't. So we talked. We talked. Uh, I talked especially glowingly about Wigman um, because I had watched film of him, and when he's good, he's really good. But he like look, Dane Brugler has his top fifty for next year, and Connor no, Wigman is the top. He's in the top twenty-five. So, like, if you're an NFL GM, you probably would prefer Connor Wigman over Riley Leonard. If you're trying to win a football game next Saturday night, you'd prefer Riley Leonard. Yeah, no, I think it's a good point. And Wigman's, uh, you know, Wigman has a lot to prove. He's only played eight games or started eight games. Man, he was good. I watched the when he had his first start as a freshman against Mississippi in 2022. He just came out blazing, and he was throwing accurately, and he was really, really good. Uh, and, and I think he's got a chance to be good, and that's all we were doing was – was answering the question about why, um, you know, this isn't going to be a cakewalk for Notre Dame and why Texas A&M is, is favored. But absolutely, Riley Leonard, the mobile quarterback, Pete, great point. Uh, you know, the trenches belong to the defensive lines, and so you want the guy that's mobile. I'm not saying Wigman isn't mobile, but he's not Riley Leonard. And, um, yeah, it's unanimous. That would be, that would be, uh, that would be my choice as well. All right, we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, we will be back on Monday, game week, August 26th, the first of two podcasts next week. 
Notre Dame, Texas A&M. I'm not sure what else we have to uh, discuss other than on Monday, we will get together with Marcus Freeman first before we record our podcast. So we'll have plenty, plenty to kick around at that point. At that point. For Tim O'Malley, I'm Tim Priester from Irish Illustrated. John Bryce is from Football Scoop and Pete Sampson is from The Athletic. This has been Irish Illustrated Insider. 